It's the When Fishing Podcast. Applying techniques. Then I put the sea rigs on the A rig. fresh ideas. They can't all be good ones. Talking stories, <laughs> reports, about five out conservation. Of probably too close. All to make you and I better fishermen. This is the first time we've really talked, like outside of texting, and like um, I've known you and shouting boat to boat across and the And shouting boat to boat, yeah, just com- like totally unable to hear you <laughs> over the radio or whatever but uh i've known about you or i've watched you through like basically sc surf fishing was where i first saw yeah, a lot of people in like socal and all these things and just like kind of watching like oh that person's seems to know what they're doing that person seems to know what they're doing that guy seems like a fucking prick that guy is pretty cool like so it's i mean it's too bad that that website went down because i was pretty it's a pretty solid group, and until uh, the one-eared chef uh, tore it down, but uh, uh, and then bloody decks, dude. I can't handle bloody decks anymore. It's just like it's just like the bickering constantly, and then I've gotten a couple passive aggressive remarks now, and I'm like, what do I do? Like, like I'm like I walk on fucking eggshells for everybody because I know everybody's just gonna get upset about anything, and like I'm passing along tips, passing along reports, and it's like, like yeah, whatever, dude. So yeah. I've- I've tried, you know, helping people out on there and I'll give them yesterday's info because that's all you can give. Yeah. You, know, you can't predict tomorrow. Right. And, you know, earlier this season, the yellowtail were right there on the beach. Yeah. They were in 20 feet of water and I told one of the guys and he spent the whole day trolling up and down the beach and then came at me later and was like, you gave me false info and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> I was like dude, here's pictures. Like, here's, here's a 35 pound yellowtail and look how close the beach is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. The, there's just people out there and they're also, I think the small, the small craft thing really gets under people's skin because they have 80, 80,000 to a million dollar boats. Yeah. And they're going out there and they're burning all this fuel and they see these guys, which we're out there on the water a lot. We strike out a lot. Yeah. But, uh, we're catching big fish. Right. We're catching 80 to 115 pound bluefin. Right. Um, I've gotten swordfish over 200 pounds there. Right. Thresher sharks. I mean, we're right on the beach catching threshers, but not right. a lot of people know how to fish them. Yeah, right. And, you know, they'll run out to the 209 or something and fish threshers. And like, that's not where you want to go. Yeah. You literally want to be in 30 feet of water. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think it just gets under people's skin because they see somebody being successful after they've invested so much. Yeah, that makes sense. That's that's really the only thing I can I can think of on, about that. But, uh yeah, then there's just the whole bloody, bloody deck started out. It was cutthroat. Yeah, like, no. People were just at each other's throats all the time, you know. You said the BD salute, the middle finger. Right. Uh, if you weren't talking shit to somebody, you know, like, obviously you didn't like them. So yeah. <laughs> if you didn't acknowledge them, you didn't like them. That's funny. Yeah, no, my, uh, I mean, like, I was, like, watching, like, my dad joined SC Surf Fishing in 2005. Mm-hmm. So I was, like, 10 years old and, like, watching the forums and that was honestly i realized that was my first taste of like the like social media instant gratification thing where i was like i was constantly like refreshing my dad's reports seeing like like who would reply especially yeah. if i caught a fish and there's a picture of me or something and people would be like good on the kid catching a fish and i'd be like hell yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah the sc surf fishing that was, that was and, a good group yeah they were like they were pretty polite and so like uh, i didn't I joined uh, Bloody Decks in 2012, so I was like 17, I guess, and like, and I, at that point it cleaned up a decent amount, mm-hmm. and like I still wasn't on it that much because I didn't have a boat. There was no real reason to, but I wanted to see what was what was up over there, and it was like, yeah, this is definitely like even even still it was like less polite than like SC surf fishing, and then um, and now I'm I'm pretty comfortable, you know, like prehistoric soul is very small but very like. I like everybody on there and everybody's mm-hmm. nice and we all, you know, it's just like half a dozen dudes, but it's just like, like you trust them and they're, yeah. <laughs> they're not going to say anything fucking ridiculous. And it's like, yeah, I mean like, you know, for the most part, if I'm going to report something then I'm going to, uh, on bloody decks and everybody's going to say like, you know, pat on the back or whatever, but even still you, you try and help somebody in like another thing and they'll go, you know, like, what do you know? Or what the fuck? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's like, what the, what? what? Okay. All right. 
So yeah, I yeah. got last year and, when I started posting <laughs> from the Kabot, I was treated yeah. like I was a brand new angler. No, that's because people didn't like obviously they don't know me personally. I've been was, fishing since I was two. It was funny watching watching you on there because you're like like you came off as just like toxically positive where you're just like <laughs> you're just like oh yeah there's striped marlin like right off of La Jolla. It's like well there are quite often or whatever you know there's there's all these like little like yeah pelagic right off like pelagic's right off Oceanside right now and like start of June or whatever and like nobody believes you and it's like it's like why not it's like you know water's warm enough and they just like refuse to like accept yeah. certain things and it's like you know like like I believe you because I know you're on the water like like a lot and uh yeah, it's just, so it's just funny, it's funny watching you, like, post things where, like, you're giving, you're giving, like, pretty solid information that everybody should want to know, and they just go, like, like, I do not believe you, that is bullshit, and it's like, I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I, but, you know I what? remember like, that, I was, uh, I was off La Jolla, and it was, I think it was June, um, it was right after the bluefin fiasco, so it was actually early July, Yeah. Uh, and I was trolling up and down from from Oceanside down to La Jolla and I cut out and I, I hit the canyon there in La Jolla and I cut out towards 178 um, just to check out that water out there and I saw you know masses of mountain mahi they were all chickens they were like three to five pounds but they were they were foaming like tuna yeah so I you know gunned it over there and there's birds diving and stuff and it was just it was mahi everywhere probably like 500 mahi in just this one little you know spot of water and the way they moved was incredible. Like if you didn't know any better, you'd think it was a whale head coming out of the water because they were all piling on top of each other, yeah, chasing the tiny micro bait, right? Um, and then they would disperse, and you could see like it was a big school of mahi, yeah. And then on the outside of those, there was a striped marlin, yeah, and it was chasing the mahi, right? So yeah, I got you know um, later on in the week, I was on bloody decks, and I told me yeah, mahi had been spotted. Then I think there was one caught on a Mad Mac off Oceanside that week. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then they started talking about the striped marlin. So yeah. I chimed in on that. I was like, a striped marlin right off of La Jolla. Right. And then the backlash started. You know, they're not here. You know, they come later in the season. They're not here till August, exactly. September. That's when all the, the pros go out and chase them. I'm like, no, they're like, they're right there. Yeah. They're chasing the mahi. And then, you know, the, a month later, the mahi were too big for the striped marlin to eat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, dude, and the, uh, uh, what's his face, uh, the dude with the, god damn, like, he's got, like, the seven boats around the world, and, like, that, that was Bad funny company. when he was, like, like, you were like, yeah, I saw, like, you know, a sword and a stripey, like, you know, in, like, close enough to each other or whatever, and he's like, you can't see that, like, <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I've seen more than anybody, I've caught more than anybody, and, yeah, he, he found uh, two surface swords down off somewhere off South America and it was like the first time ever recorded first time seen by people and I'm like no that's that's not true (laughs) (laughs) just because you know you're a millionaire and you're popular putting it out there doesn't mean it's the first time yeah that's ever happened like last year was incredible I saw six or seven swordfish on the surface not even looking for them just cruising yeah you know because we cruise around those boats at 12 to 15 miles an hour yeah if that and just along that ledge along the continental shelf launch out Oceanside, head south, zigzag. Um, we came across six or seven swordfish just fitting on the surface. The big one was massive. It was yeah. it was probably as thick as our kibbutz. Yeah. And uh, never seen a fish that looked like that. Just, you know, a barrel. It looks like two barrels put together with a fin and a bill. Yeah. It's super incredible. Uh, yeah. You know, then my buddy Dale, I don't know if you've met him, Dale Edmonds. Um, yeah. He's pretty low-key. On social media and he hasn't post on any of the forums but uh he's probably one of the better fishermen here in southern california it just doesn't put himself out there yeah uh he was out there and he saw two striped marlin working a little bait ball like right next to each other yeah and then sent us the video and i was like did, did you go after him he's like no i just watched <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah southern california is incredible a lot more a lot more fish and pelagics here than i would ever th- have thought because growing up you had to get on a boat well in my earlier years up until shoot until i was like 15 16 it was all albacore right and uh you get on a three-quarter day boat and go catch albacore and a yellowfin were mixed in and a bluefin yeah. was just the the anomaly right um and there were just as many big eyes bluefin at that point right 
Like they're, I'm not like sure they're, about Big Eye. I know that like I used to scan Sport Fishing Report a lot, and I I remember seeing like just like a spackling of Big Eye like in the early 2000s, where like we we never see them now. I think we we might have seen like one in the past year or something like that. And like at least if, if you scan like there historically, it's like. You'll see them now, I guess, as often as you'd see an albacore now out here or something like that. Where mm-hmm. It's like, like, oh, there's one this year, and like the bluefin seemed like it was, it was kind of like that, at that point. Yeah. Um, so the last, I want to say six years, ever since that really warm year, I think 2015, 2016. Right. I was in Japan at the time. I was living in Okinawa, and that's when I was really started following bloody decks. Yeah. Which is weird because I didn't really follow bloody decks the entire time I lived out here. Yeah. And then I moved to Japan. And the big thing out there was marlin fishing. Yeah. And I was deckhanding for Salty Rods Charters. And it would just be, it'd be me and the captain. And yeah. the captain is Japanese, um, speaks a little bit of English, but he's usually in the wheelhouse. And he's driving the whole day. Um, he'd come out and help unhook fish, you know, if it got yeah. overwhelming. But we're out there trolling and everybody wants to catch marlin. So I had to figure out how to catch marlin. And at the time, Bloody Decks had a billfish for him. Yeah. And it was just dedicated to billfish. Well... Same idea for the spreads, but the stuff that works out here yeah. does not work out there in Japan. Uh-huh. <laughs> the colors are different. The heads are different. It's just, the speed's different. Yeah. Uh, we were trolling a lot faster out there. Yeah. Uh, What's I the remember, speed here versus there? Well, I remember they were saying anywhere from 8 to 10 knots. For here? For here. Um, I think even Hawaii mm-hmm. and down in anywhere in Mexico where they target them. They were saying 8 to 10 knots was the average. And out there in Japan, we were cruising at 10 to 12 knots. Yeah. So longer heads yeah. that have a shorter slant to them. That way they, they track better and you don't get a huge, if you have a, a fatter head with a, a flat face on, it's just going to be too much pressure. Uh, they make a good wake and they make a good bubble trail, Yeah. but they also pop and jump and it just, sometimes the hook will come flying up and grab the leader it, it comes a mess. Yeah. So if you're cruising slow and you're actually targeting Marlin, you can go 8 to 10. Those yeah. are fine. But when we're transiting from the harbor, you know, they're 25, 30 miles offshore. Yeah. We're putting out a Marlin spread and we're hoping we get Marlin, which worked out a lot. Um, but yeah, that's when I started following Bloody Decks. And uh, they were talking about having 75, 76, and up to 78 degree water. Yeah. And I remember reading that and I... One of my first posts on there, I was like, you guys might want to start pulling some Wahoo lures, you know, because that's, that's the temperature that we have out here, 78 to 80. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, in like a week, they were posting Wahoo. Damn. And I'm not saying they took my advice, but, yeah, but it was you know, there. called yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so that was super cool. And then, you know, that, that sparked my interest, interest for coming back to California because I thought it was going to stay. I thought yeah. that was going to be the norm. Um, turns out it's not. And then we've been praying for Wahoo ever since. Right. And, uh, that year, remember that year they had snow and hail that stuck to, uh, Doheny. Yeah. And earlier this year it snowed on Doheny beach. That's right. So I was like, Hey, is, you know, is history going to repeat itself? Yeah. And uh, a couple of guys on there were like, no, you're fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't but, get quite as, as warm this year, but and I'm kind of glad that the Mahi didn't do what they did last year i got i mean like i like i was gapping like a hundred of them a day for a minute as as a deckhand and it was like i just never wanted to see one after that even though like they used to be my favorite favorite fish and then i realized like after that that they really don't deserve to be a favorite fish just because they're they're just like they look cool they yeah yeah, they look cool but then it's like they're kind of whores and like (laughs) they, they fuck like rabbits and they're like really plentiful at least when they're around it's like yeah. Like it's, uh, I think you, you got to respect a fish that's, that's harder to get. I mean, kind of like a blue fin. I, 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 now it's like, I'm focusing, I think next year I'm going to focus. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say that, but like, I, I was going to say, I want to focus on striped Marlin, but it's like, you know, you get, you get a couple shots a year. And so it's not like something you can really focus on, especially as like a small boater, like who's staying coastal, like yeah, if you're lucky, you're gonna you're gonna run up on a couple, or if you spend enough time out there, you're gonna run up on a couple. But yeah. for the most part, like, like I, I know that there were a, there were a handful recorded like off of like around Newport Canyon in like late June or something like that, and I was like, okay, like this is gonna be a good year, and I didn't I don't think I heard another peep about 
Marlin local. Well, they usually have the Marlin tournament. Yeah. And so IGFA, I believe, I don't really follow all their tournaments, but I believe they have the Marlin tournament and they had a tuna and the swordfish tournament. Yeah. But this year they did like an all-in-one pelagics tournament, like the Marlin or the IGFA Open. Yeah. And I didn't really follow that because I was hoping that the swordfish one would come and I was going to enter the swordfish tournament. Yeah. Um, but they just didn't do it this year. So last year I heard about the whole Marlin tournament and all the Marlin that came in and like hookups and stuff. And yeah. it seemed like they were fishing around from Avalon up to the north side of Catalina. It seems to be that area that they fish yeah. for them. Um, <clears throat> but also we have a really short window for the striped marlin yeah at least i feel like because i mean we saw them in june or in july everybody says it's like august september that you usually fish them but that short window and if you're working every day then you have to find a good weather window to go out and then if the chlorophyll and the temp break is different on that day then you're just absolutely screwed yeah (laughs) yeah so it'd be i feel like it'd be super hard in our smaller boats not not completely impossible but super difficult especially with that small small time uh window to get out there yeah but yeah definitely definitely something i'd like to do something yeah. i'd like to see you do yeah no it's uh uh hanging over hanging over me now that uh at least i finally got the bluefin and the thresher that was my main thing like once i saw you know when you first you, when you got your first one i started thinking like maybe like literally within 24 hours of you catching it i was thinking to myself water temp is right like I looked at the conditions on like uh on Terrafin or whatever and I was like, Oh hell yeah, like like me and Chris should buddy boat. And then like as soon as I think that I go on Instagram to like tell you and then there you are with like your your first one that was like hundred fifteen or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> like <laughs> you beat me to it. I mean you let me in on the bite and that I, that was really cool seeing those for the first time. Cause like that was one like that was the first time I really went offshore and I was like, uh at least no, not entirely true, but um, first time going like like for tuna, and so it was just like you know getting out there. I wasn't seeing a lot of life, and the next thing I know, I see like what well, looks like dolphins, and it's like hundred fifty pound bluefin like coming straight at me, and then like hook up to one, lose it because it was like stock treble, and then like a little bit later, like run up like five minutes later, run up on another one, and then I look below the boat, and it's like crystal clear water, and there's like hundred fifty pound class fish just going under like 20 feet under the boat and i'm like dude like these things could just like it just feels like a herd of cows literally (laughs) that could just like bowl you over and just murder you without thinking about it and i was just like dude this is like you know this is nat geo shit like i mean like i wish i caught one but like this alone is just amazing and um and struggled for another year and change to finally get one but um but yeah that that shit's wild and then um that was a that was a cool bite um uh yeah what's cool in... our, our little boats the especially the kibbutz i noticed with mine not so much <clears throat> that new briz that i have yeah the black one it's got a 30 horsepower it's got the new inline three cylinder power head yeah um it doesn't seem to be as stealthy around the the bluefin because i've ran into them a couple times and they yeah. just pff, they they run away yeah but it's also super late in season which yeah. is on par with how they act but the kibbutz with the small motors, it seems like either they're attracted to it yeah. or they just don't care because so, they will come right up to the boat. They'll, they'll foam. You can sit right in the yeah. middle of the foam and they'll stay there yeah. and you can literally reach out and touch them. So that, yeah, I saw, I saw your, vi- some videos that like you're like hooked up and then they're just like, it's they're just, bumping into it the looks boat. like you're in a river. Yeah. Like it's ridiculous. But I know that, um, like as I was watching some maintenance, uh, maintenance videos on my Mercury six, I realized that, uh, the motors I've been using, the four and the six, uh, are single cylinder and, uh, especially the six, because it's like the most powerful single cylinder, it's going to have the most vibration, yep. uh, because there's not like another cylinder to, uh, to balance it out. So once you get into the three cylinder, is it, uh, is it sort of a similar effect where it's not balancing out with the, like so you, it's, you have two cylinders on the 9.8, right? Yeah, it was two cylinders on the 9.8. And it didn't seem as rough at idle. Yeah. Like there wasn't a lot of vibration at idle. But when you got up into the higher end of the throttle, uh, it was louder. It was definitely louder and it had kind of like a, 
I compare everything like a V6 to a V8. Sure. But you know that V8 like rumble, like it just sounds like it has power. That's what the two cylinder almost sounds like. It's yeah. it's a lot scaled down. Yeah. But it almost has that like growl to it. Yeah. And then the three cylinder, for some reason, it has. I mean, it's. I guess they're both in line, but the three cylinder just has that. Um. Like a super rough idle. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say rough because then it sounds like the motor's not running right. Right. But it's just, it, it shakes. It's almost yeah. like like my 5.9 Cummins is an inline six cylinder. Sure. And that thing rattles. Yeah. Especially at idle. Um, that's kind of how that one is. And then, but once you start it and once you start going, it's quiet. Yeah. I, I can hardly hear it behind me. So I think, I think it's just putting off a different pitch yeah. into the water and they can hear it or even... Uh, my prop is putting off some kind of harmonic pitch right and they hear that and they don't like it but i haven't had issues getting within casting range but they definitely don't stick around yeah interesting hmm. but it is nice having a 30 horsepower versus a 9.8 yeah i bet <laughs> i bet that's that's gotta be i'm i'm a little jealous i mean like i'm honestly i've kind of been redlining with with at least the way that i assemble the mosquito is like like, I just go, like, dude, I mean, at least now I'm inflating it the night before, so I don't have quite as much, like, you know, time to kill in the morning or whatever, but, um, uh, but it's just, like, so much work putting it together. It's, like, I really, like, I don't have a place to put, like, a trailer, but, like, I'm so ready to, um, at least mentally, not in any other way, to, yeah. like, just pick up, like, a, like, a little living stand or something like that. I'd like a 14 or a 155 or something like that. And uh, uh, put some twins, twin twin thirties for the fourteen would be cool, or um, twin for the Tohatsus because that'd be like two two hundred sixty pounds total or something like that. And then uh, on the one five five, I saw somebody put something ridiculous uh, on on the back of it. Whatever it was, it was heavier than two Honda fifties. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do two Honda fifties if I do a one five five. But that's all like that's a couple years out. But it's uh yeah, dude. I'm like getting a little bit sick of the little and little inflatable. <laughs> like I haven't, I actually haven't been out in almost a month. Um, which is the longest I've gone since coming since I got like my outboard back like a year and a half ago from some long like COVID maintenance and whatever. And uh, like I'm, I mean, I've got this like ridiculous car repair that I had to pay, so I just had to like cut all spending and like focus all focus up. So I'm pretty much out of that, and I I'll, I think I'm gonna go try and deep drop on Wednesday. We'll see if the weather continues to permit. But there's a pretty good weather window then, and uh, but yeah, I'm a little bit. I'm I'm like I want to go faster. Like yeah. I'm going like especially like so I wanted to ask um, like it looks so what I do when I uh when I'm putting the boat in the water uh is like I have it on like basically a kayak cart. I I, mm. th I put like the kayak dolly underneath it and then I throw the outboard on the uh, transom and then I wheel it into the water by hand and uh, and then when I take it out of the water I take the outboard off of the transom walk it over to the car uh, throw it in the car and then I grab the boat and like pull it out of the water so that like you know that um, uh, the outboard isn't like dragging onto the ramp so like you use I know I know you can definitely lift more than I can but like like sixty five pounds with the, with the six horsepower kind of feels like my limit. I really don't want to like lift ninety pounds of outboard like that. The way that you would have to like off the ramp in the yeah. water, like I don't want to do that. So how do you? How would you do that? Like when you were taking the boat in and out of the water with the nine point eight. Just manhandle it. Yeah. Like I don't. I don't want like a bragging moment here, but. <laughs> I am larger than most people. Yeah, you I are. No, you're six and a half feet tall and pushing three hundred pounds. And yeah, I've lifted, been lifting pretty much my entire life. Yeah, uh, but only properly for the past about five years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other stuff is just gym bros, gym bro workouts, and sure. you know anything my buddies wanted to do. But yeah. uh, yeah, it's just it's easier for me to pick up a hundred pound outboard. Yeah. and lift it straight up, and also. Where somebody that's six foot tall yeah. would be almost dragging the lower unit on the, the ground. Yeah, I lift it and just flex a little bit, and it's you know it, it's almost a foot off the ground because I'm so tall. Yeah, so it, it's easier to do that, and then getting it in the back, I put it in the back of my uh, my pickup truck, which is a twenty five hundred, 
and the, the 2500 heavy duties they come stock taller than normal like 1500s or the yeah the two-wheel drive uh 2500s so it's almost like a lifted truck yeah um but i would just grab grab the top end and kind of squat back with it and get the lower unit up and parallel with my hips and then slide it in to the back of the truck gotcha and then hop up in the back of the truck and then pick it up again put it on a motor stand that i had uh ratchet strapped into the back up against the back of the bed yeah and then tighten it down on that and that's where i would transport my motor okay um like my my girlfriend would never be able to accomplish that on her own (laughs) so very very few people could do that on their own um i mean i'm sure there's a majority of guys that are gonna listen to this and be like yeah i can do that and they probably could but um yeah when people ask me what motor to get for those yeah. i always tell them the six horsepower yeah just because it, it'll get you above 10 miles an hour and really you only if you're cruising around in the bays or inshore you don't yeah. have to go much faster yeah uh, there are definitely like i mean i go out on so many like cupcake days basically i mean i'm like i'll admit i'm totally like fair weather fisherman because like like i've kind of designed my life around it where it's like i grub hub full time so it's like so i can pick any morning i like like mm-hmm. seven days a week but i'm also working seven days a week so like it's like you know it's the trade-off and like so i'm picking like like you know where the swell period is like three to one or four to one or even better and like a lot of those days i'm like heading out there and i'm like i know if i had the top end i could use it and then of course like yeah as soon as there's any chop it's like I, you know, I don't even want to go full speed at 12 knots or whatever. Yeah. It's like, like I'm kind of eating shit at 10 or whatever the hell. But there's one other guy who uh, launches out here that I've kind of become internet friends with. Uh, he also uses a 9.8. So I've been meaning to ask him. But I know he, he actually uses like a, like a mud bank in the, uh, in Huntington Harbor to, to launch. And like, that sounds like a lot of work to me where like, he's got to come down this berm and like, you know, with the 9.8 and the boat and everything else. And I'm like, yeah, I'd rather pay the 15 bucks in the, at the ramp. And like, especially if there's a little dock there. Yeah. No, the, like, yeah, there's a South shores, um, uh, in mission Bay. Mm -hmm. It's nice cause it's free, but it is a little bit of a trick to like, to drag the boat, like, uh, launch it, drag it, you know, without a ramp. Like there is the ramp, but you have to like, there's, it's like a bridge that's like way higher than the water for like like 30 50 feet and so you can't just like walk it on a rope i mm-hmm. guess you could if you had a long enough rope and i, I have like a 10 foot dock leash or something like that because i'm just i do what i do but um yeah just like when i go over there which has only been a few times i've it's like okay well now i gotta like take actually take it like you know take the outboard off in the bank and like get my feet wet and all this shit and it's like yeah like too much work for me so yeah so uh i was curious um i mean it was it was gonna be my first question but like how did you like what was your first getting into fishing like how did you get into it and what was the environment that eventually got you like addicted to it so my dad force fed me fishing yeah uh when i was a baby i came home because he had me on the pier all day with him nice. and half my face was sunburned. Yeah. I guess my mom was super mad about that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, like my dad was obsessed with fishing. Um, that was his pastime, like the way that he relieved stress. So, and he was stationed down here on Pendleton. So I lived down here in Oceanside or down in Oceanside until I was six. Mm-hmm. And then we moved up to Ranch Cucamonga in San Bernardino County. And uh, from there, we fished the lakes and stuff. Mm-hmm. But he had, and we'd still come down and fish like Santa Monica Pier, Newport Pier. Newport Pier was one of uh, our favorite places to go. Mm-hmm. But uh, he had a boat, and it was uh, kind of like a crossover. I don't, a bow rider, like a pleasure yeah. boat, like a river boat almost. Inboard, outboard, and he made some rod holders for the back so we could we could troll and his thing would, was going out and trolling for shark, and we'd catch makos mm. and blue sharks and stuff. And first shark I caught was a five foot mako mm. on a pen six aught, and just had it in the rod holder and reeled it in. You know, yeah. six aughts are already in low gear. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I sat on on the side of the boat there and just reeled it in. He gaffed it, and you know, I, I caught a mako. I was like, 
I was on cloud nine. I was yeah. like five years old. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that memory has always stuck with me. And then we were landlocked for a little bit. Not really landlocked, but an hour and a half from the beach. Yeah. You don't just it's a trip. pick up and go. Yeah. So we fished the, the lakes and we just started targeting, you know, the bigger fish, the, uh, the carp that are in there. Nobody yeah. really wants to catch them, but you go down there with a trout rod yeah. and some mealworms and start start catching big carp on six pound test, four oh, yeah. pound test. It's fun. Yeah. Um, so then we did that a lot and we fished uh, Pudding Stone, Frank G. Benelli Park. Mm-hmm. We fished that place a lot and uh, really learned the ins and out of that lake. Had a lot of good times. And then when I was, sorry, I got to think a minute. I want to say when I was 18. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, wait, what, uh, what year were you born? 1990. Okay, so you, you got five years on me. Okay. Yeah. So and then I joined the Marine Corps when I was 18. Yeah. I went to Okinawa, Japan, came back in 2011. So 2011, I bought my first kayak. Mm-hmm. And then it was, I guess, I want to say all downhill from there, but kind of uphill too, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Because it just, you know, fishing became a money pit after yeah. that. I was doing a lot of surf fishing before that, catching leopard sharks, right. chasing soup fin, but then I had a kayak, so had to re-rig for the kayak, had to get electronics, fish yeah. finder, um, batteries, get the chargers, make sure yeah. I had extra batteries, and then oh, make yeah. sure I had a way to transport a 13 foot, it was a 14, it was X, uh, Malibu X Factor, Yeah. so I think it was 14.4, um, the thing's a barge, it'll go anywhere, Yeah. you know, you, it takes a lot of effort to get the thing going, yeah. but then it just doesn't stop. So you okay. just keep paddling and it goes, it goes through chopping waves and nice. it was great. Yeah. Um, fish La Jolla a lot and got into the yellowtail down there, started learning the halibut game. Yeah. And, uh, by that time, by the time I started, you know, dipping my toes into the halibut, I PCS out to Florida mm-hmm. and right around that time I came up on a deal for a Hobie pro angler. Mm-hmm. So I bought the Hobie Pro Angler out here, and then it was in, like, November of 2012, and then I PCS'd in January of 2013. So I had the the Hobie, caught my first yellowtail on the Pro Angler, not my first t- yellowtail ever, but first yellowtail on the Pro Angler Yeah. in December, and then packed it up and went to uh, Florida. Nice. Um, and then we did a lot of land-based shark fishing out there. Mm-hmm. Um, did a lot of kayak fishing, and the kayak fishing was great because... We were almost breaking new ground because a lot of people would say, like, things didn't bite at night. Nobody really fished at night. They wouldn't take their boats out at night, kayaks out at night. Yeah. And me and my buddy really only had time to fish at night. Yeah. So we'd be fishing off the beach for sharks, and a couple times we were like, just take the kayaks out, and we'll go out to the artificial reef. It's it's like five. One was about five miles, the other one was about seven and a half miles. <laughs> But you troll the whole time. You put king yeah. rigs back. You put a deep diver. Um, I trolled the the uh, X wrap. I want to say twelve. It's not the one with the small lip. It's the the first size with a a bigger deep diver lip. Yeah, I think it's a twelve. It might be a fourteen. Troll one of those, and then a duster with a king rig, which is just three treble hooks, and you put a dead bait on there. Yeah, usually the uh, oh, they're a type of minnow. I forget what they're called, but you can just buy a fro- frozen bag of them, kind of like anchovies, but yeah. they're in way better condition because yeah. they take care of their bait out there. They don't just put it in a bag and throw it in a freezer. It yeah. takes three days to freeze it. Yeah. Uh, so we'd get those or catch some hard heads or blue, ru- blue runners, which they look like little giant trevally. Right. Or, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I fished a little bit in Corpus Christi, so I know yeah. both of those, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Catch those in the eight to 10 inch range. And yeah. then you put those out behind you and yeah. you're doing kayak speed. You're doing like two and a half miles an hour. Yeah. So it takes three, three hours to get out there. <laughs> but we started catching fish at yeah. midnight. Yeah. You know, we're, we're coming back or going out at yeah. midnight, depending if we were going to go out and fish till morning or we launched at sunset and we're coming back. Uh, but we're getting smoked by kingfish in the middle of the night and yeah. catching, you know, not huge ones, eight to 12 pound kingfish but yeah. it was like unheard of yeah. and i asked so many people you know why don't you guys fish at night are they do they bite at night a couple of guys were like oh i heard they do or something like that they you know stories and then they do i went on a um a twilight out of uh corpus christi and 
Um, I know we were drifting for like kings and, and stuff like that. Like it was very much like wire leaders and uh, over there it was, they were using a lot of uh, like dead ribbon fish, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I guess at least they knew about it over there, but it was, that was also a fucking horrible night of fishing. It was like a new moon or a full moon or some bullshit and the deckhand was like, oh, this is going to suck. And it's like, <laughs> but anyways, go on. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so the night fishing out there, we'd go out to the artificial reefs and catch snapper and amberjack. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't really get sharked at night, which was weird. That is weird. And then during the day, we go out there and pull up half an amberjack yeah. because it got sharked. Yeah. But fishing at night, it was like the sharks didn't really chase those fish that are <clears throat> being harassed and hooked and stuff. So that was nice. Um, I thought we were going to have a lot more run-ins with sharks at night, which I think the yeah. only one I can really remember was a small tiger shark, like yeah. four or five foot. Yeah. It came up and just circled around the kayaks and then left. Yeah. And it was, that was it. So uh, in SoCal, we have like the predictable afternoon winds and maybe a little bit of like a, uh, n- like a north morning wind. Mm-hmm. Like in uh, what part of Florida were you in? And what kind of, what kind of like uh, wind patterns uh is it over there? So I was in, <clears throat> I was in Destin, Eglin Air Force Base, uh, which is next to Destin, but we would always fish down by Pensacola, Yeah, which was like a 40 minute drive. Uh, the winds, so we'd get the north winds in the fall and they come right out of the north and they rip like 25 miles an hour. Yeah. And that's when everybody, they, they use kites off the beach and they use yeah. kites off the piers. Uh, something that I've wanted to try out here, yeah. but it's just... The winds are more or less predictable out here. Yeah. And uh, it never seems to be like a perfect wind to fly a kite off of here out here. Like yeah. Maybe early morning. Yeah. But then it, it switches at like 10. Yeah. And then, you know, you're done. But out there, the winds would blow pretty much all day. And you can get a kite up and uh, either off the beach or the pier and then fish it just like we do out here with the kite and the breakaway or yeah. use a little uh, clothespin. And then skip a small live bait or dead bait across service and catch kings and cobia and yeah. stuff like that. Um, Jack Creval. Yeah. Those. So that's that's a really interesting way of fishing that they they do out there. There's a few guys that did it often. Yeah. Um, I don't really hear about it too much anymore. Yeah. But the winds, and then during the summer they were super predictable too. It seemed like the wind would come out of the southwest so when we went out to the artificial reefs yeah. and we came in in the evenings yeah. the wind would be at our back nice and it's kind of like here like you can go out in the morning and it's super calm yeah then that wind picks up or you're going with the wind out and right. it's super smooth and then even though the swell and the chop picks up yeah. you're coming in with it yeah. so it's not as bad okay um, yeah i was i was curious like when when you said going out five to seven miles at night in a kayak i'm like like i know i, I guess i was originally thinking like like Miami and stuff like that and I know yeah, that they can not... be a little bit more uh the the the, the wind is pretty un... I wouldn't say unpredictable but it changes a lot like over there so I was curious if yeah, like it's not like the east coast or south florida where yeah. it's unpredictable and there's giant waves there was more glass days on the gulf yeah. than there was when there was a ripple on the water right uh we did have a couple of tropical storms and we had a hurricane that came through the south that really turned it up. And yeah. even those days, it was like your average mediocre day here in Southern California. Like, sure. There's some white caps, but still plowed through it and tried to go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, not not bad at all. I guess when you get out towards the rigs and you get out way out there in the Gulf, it's more unpredictable. But within yeah. 10 miles of the, sh- the shoreline, like, we we could go anywhere. Yeah. Super fun out there. Yeah. Oh, that sounds nice. Um, and that's the other thing. I think fishing a kayak like that for so long was an easy transition into the inflatable. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because I'm used to going two and a half, three miles an hour. Yeah. And now I can go 10 to 15. Yeah. And I'm almost going too fast. Yeah. Because in the kayak, I always have bait behind me. Yeah. So then I learn where the fish are. Like I pass by a certain kelp yeah. or a certain rock. Yeah. You know, and... I learned that there's fish that congregate around there by having a bait out behind me yeah. here or with having that inflatable, I'm going too fast. I'm not always pulling a bait. So I'm, I'm passing up fish. I know yeah. I am. 
Uh, and they could be, you know, 100 yards out of the harbor. Right. So that's that's a downfall. Um, and I think we're both experienced that where we just want to chase what we know is there, especially yeah. the tuna. Yeah. And the tuna and the pelagics and the yellowfin, because they just, it seems like the yellowfin hung out further out this year. Yeah. Last I year, that. I have video of them a mile off the pier, and they yeah. were, you know, right there at the drop-off transition from 90 to 300 feet of water. And wow. Uh, there's yellowfin jumping and there's the pier in the background and this year i didn't really see that i saw deep dropping lately there's still some coastal bluefin yeah but like i said they they run as soon as you get yeah. near them so they're still around but the the yellowfin that like you see them out the 43 and yeah. hear about the 302 and it's like i want to get out there i want to get out there fast get in that zone because i yeah. can see the temp break and the chloral break and just start in that zone yeah but then i'm limited to 15 to 20 miles an hour so it's gonna take me two hours to get there yeah no it's uh, that's been a big challenge with it where it's yeah you really got to get to know your intercoastal stuff with these boats where like you can work it so effectively inside of like 15 miles but then you start to get further out and you're spending a lot of time for to get out there for for very little a lot of times so yeah it's uh yeah i mean i saw some um like, when the yellowfin first showed up, I was able to at least, like, drop a tatty on their heads. I didn't get any, but it was, uh, uh, saw them out of Dana Point. That was, like, the first week of July or something mm-hmm. like that, but I never saw any, any more myself, but, yeah, it did seem like they were out far. Uh, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we usually have them, at least into October, they'll yeah. be within earshot of the harbor, you know, right. but they just weren't. That I know of, and yeah. I'm out there a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the Bluefin put on a show this year. Yeah. They stuck around. They stuck around good, and they showed up in numbers. We had it everywhere from 20-pound fish to 150-pound fish. Yeah. And they were all mixed in. Yeah. You know, they, they were in their own little groups, but they were mixed in. You could go from Oceanside up to Dana Point. Yeah. And hit every size fish along the way. Yeah. And uh, one day I lost seven I remember that because I had I had forty <laughs> pound top shot on my Alua ninety three H, and uh, I was like, you know, I, I'm using the uh, Daiwa Zakana yeah. lure, and it it's decent. It's like four or five inches long, depending yeah. on the hundred or hundred thirty gram. And you know, bite they bite down on that, and I'm thinking that it's not going to rub through. It'll be fine. I can get them in. And then you know, I'm on a fish for ten minutes, and I'm like, this is an eighty plus pound fish. Yeah, and they bite through it. Yeah. It just comes. Comes loose. The, the one that I got, um, like, I mean, it was in the realm of a hundred pounds, I'll say. And it, I had the Yozuri high speed vibe, which is like a six inch bait. And like, I was using hundred or 125 pound liter and it inhaled that thing. It was like a foot down its gullet. Mm-hmm. And like, thankfully it was a pretty docile fish. Like I, like it came at me and then I had it like in the boat in like five minutes or something like that. But like, when I saw how, like, you know, how big its mouth was and how much it inhaled it, I was like, oh, dude, like, like, yeah, if this were on for, like, 30 minutes or an hour, I would have lost it. Like, it was, yeah. um, that, that shit's nuts. But, yeah, no, those, those things have some real teeth and, like, I'm, yeah, I'm not fucking around. Like, I'm probably, even on my jig stick, I'm, like, throwing, like, 80-pound liter or something mm-hmm. like that. And just <clears throat> hope for the reaction bite. Yeah, I was thinking of running wire. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't catch a lot of fish on the troll. I haven't caught a bluefin on the troll on my inflatable. Yeah. I got a about a 160. Uh, me, me and my buddy took out a Slade A boat. That's right. Earlier this year. And uh, it was a charter that one of my buddies, who I know pretty well, and two of his buddies had gone in on. And my buddy had to back out. Yeah. So I was going to fill his spot and then go with these guys and basically drive the boat and try to try to find fish that day. And then that morning, the other guy had an accident. He went through the exit only of a parking lot and got his tire slashed. Oh, so. my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> so he ended up having to bail last minute. So it was me and Mike and my son. And we went out there and we started up in, uh, in Huntington. And I think, it, yeah, it was Huntington. Started up there in Huntington and uh, went down... Outside the rigs, worked the the ledge down to the fourteen. Yeah, and then we were seeing seeing life, and we were seeing 
like breezers on the top, and I think right. it was Yellowfin because the seniors were in there. Yeah, and they were in there thick. Um, but we weren't getting anything to bite. Yeah, and like we would see breezing fish, but then we'd stop on a patty or something floating. And there was nothing around it. Yeah, which was weird to me. So uh, after trolling around and trying to follow breezing fish and not having any luck, we decided we were gonna cut over towards Catalina and see if we could find some yellows, some yellowtail up on the beach, which had been going off for about a week prior to that. And on our way over, we got to the 277, and we're in line with this other boat, and we're just cruising. Both of us are looking for fish, you can yeah. tell. And then up up in the distance, probably like 500 yards, there's a foamer. Yeah. And I can tell that they saw it because they started speeding up. But then as they're speeding up, a foamer blew up like 100 yards off their bow. Oh, man. So they stopped. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's their fish. I'm going to go to these ones. Yeah. And then on our way to those ones, another foamer blew up about 100 yards oh my God. You know, off of our starboard side. So we're surrounded by fish. Nice. And it just, it turned into like a two-mile square of foamers. <sighs> and there were like 14 or 15 boats that came in. There was kites up in the air. Nice. People doing donuts with Mad Max and stuff. And we got one fish. It turned out to be around 160. And uh, we dipped out. Yeah. Like, there were so many people. By the time we got our fish, there was so many people in there just crisscrossing. It oh, wasn't yeah. worth it. Yeah. Um, tried to get a good line on a couple of foamers to pull the Mad Maxes. We were under gun for yeah. lures, especially with that size of fish. Yeah. So we had the trollers out. And we get in line to go around and across the foamer. Because when you, when you pull the Mad Max through, you want to go out around them. And then turn sharp and then straighten out again so your line comes through them and through that foam, but you're you're not running through the fish. Yeah. Uh, we try to do that and then, you know, get like a half circle on them and there's another boat cutting through the, the foamer or there's a kite, right. you know, that you're going to run over and it's like, yeah. it's time to go. <laughs> Unfortunately, that yeah. could have been my only day of getting two tuna, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No, that's... Uh fucking hectic once you get out there with that kind of stuff but yeah no you uh you had a pretty good year this year and then you just got your second second sword from an inflatable correct mm -hmm. i feel like you i feel like i, I hesitate because it feels like you got them free now because uh i don't know but um i've got a i've got a really dumb question for for a sword fisherman uh uh i like i see the i see the setup and how you have some will use two weights. I guess you can get away with one weight. Uh, and, like, it's for, like, a really basic, like, a, a layman's rig. It's basically a Carolina rig with how, how except with, like, 60 feet a liter or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I'm curious, like, why wouldn't basically, like, a dropper loop drop shot, like, style of, like, straight in line with the sinker on the end work? Are you worried about that, that weight working the hook free during the fight or like the fish not approaching the bait to begin with because of the line um i'm just following the lead of sure, people yeah. that have been doing this for 30 years yeah <laughs> they yeah. figured it out on the east coast and it transitioned over here yeah the drop i think the dropper loop style or like you can do a double dropper for bottom fishing i think something right. like that because People have caught swordfish doing that. They've yeah. dropped down in 1,200 feet of water in the Gulf and on the East Coast, and they, they hook a swordfish, so yeah. it would work. Yeah. But that long leader, the presentation, and I use 75 to 100 foot. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, when you drop it, there, you don't want your bait to spin, and you rig it so right. it doesn't spin. But if it does spin, and it's dropping straight down, it's going to wrap up on the leader yeah. or your main line. So having that long leader, your bait is 100 feet 75 to 100 feet away from the weight and then you drive the boat forward as right. you're letting line out so it basically becomes a v in yeah. the water rather than an l if right. that makes sense so you don't yeah, have your line you're, straight you're maintaining down. like like a kind of a right angle with yeah. the with the angle facing the ground as it drops so you don't so they the so they don't cross don't and yeah and tangle yeah and then also the lights so you would have to put lights on your main line, which would probably be braid. Yeah. And then figure out how to clip them on there. You don't want to damage braid. Braid damage is a lot easier than mono. Right. Uh, it's basically like a trolling spread. So you have your bait in the back, and then you have a light. And I've seen people put them three feet from the bait, six feet from the bait. Yeah. Um, usually 12 to 20 feet, your first little diamond light, it blinks. 
and then another 15 to 20 feet, put another one. Yeah. And then you have your weight and larger, uh, larger light that puts out a lot of lumens and like an illuminated area. Yeah. So those, those act kind of like a trolling spread. So you have your blinking lights, your, your big one is like the boat. So when you're trolling, the boat attracts fish. Yeah. Uh, unless it's bluefin. Yeah. And it scares away the fish. But when you're trolling the boat, usually attracts fish. So think of that light as your boat. And then yeah. you have your spread. You have your teasers and, you know, all the ones around the boat that are get, getting the attention of the fish to come up. And they, they chase those um, or they at least have more interest in it because they see them in your prop wash. Right. Uh, so those lights are kind of like that. That's getting the attention making it look like there's something feeding down there, there's squid blinking, or there's another fish over there. So then they come to investigate, yeah. and then you have your shotgun or your whiskey line, which is your actual main bait, the squid, way way back there in the back. Mm -hmm. And it's almost out of the, the illuminated area, just kind of like in the shadow. Yeah. So when that predatory fish comes in and he's looking at what's in there, he comes across your bait. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, he's going to hit that yeah. and get it because it's in the dark and, right. you know, he's got the element of surprise yeah um that's the way i look mm -hmm. at it and then also having 100 feet of heavy mono use 200 pound wind on with 65 pound braid right uh, when i get two wraps of 200 pound mono on my reel yeah then i can up the drag and i can put more pressure on that fish and then keep him there on the leader rather than worry about him you know taking off with only 18 to 20 pounds of drag and using 65 pound braid how much uh how much drag are you putting on once you have the 200 pound on uh so i haven't i usually don't bump it above strike strike yeah. is set at 20 to 21 yeah and then full if i remember right was 31 on my pen um i haven't had to do that but i'll definitely thumb the spool yeah or just put my hand on it so it doesn't go down or grab the line and then pull and crank at the same time to get line back on the reel. Yeah. It's just, it's more comfortable. I would definitely not do that with the, the braid in the water. Yeah. Just cause you don't know, there could be some kind of small nick or whatever. Yeah. I get that. Um, so yeah, I'm just following what people have done yeah. since they started it and, uh, it works. Yeah. So, no, I like, I definitely, uh, see like, you know, uh, if you Google swordfish rig, you're going to get essentially the same product, but like everybody has different variations on how long, how long the, uh, your leaders are, how much weight you have, if you're going to have a breakaway weight, if you're going to yeah. like, you know, what kind of baits you're going to use, how you're going to rig them, how many lights, how far up the lights are, blah, blah, blah. It's all personal preference. So like when I was like, when I, like this year when I started dropping for sables, like, I like thought to myself like you know like swords are like might be in the same area there's a chance like it's not a big chance but there's also not been a lot of hook and line sable fishermen in SoCal so like there's not a lot of data as to whether you're going to run into a sword or not and so like the first thing I thought was well if I'm going to have two hooks down there one might as well be like a you know like a 4x like you know like with like 200 pound to it and then have like so I had like a at least the first couple times I went out, it, yeah, I did like a three-way swivel where like the the second swivel is like built off of the first one. So that one's got like like the seven-aught circle hook and that's got like a big whole squid or something like that. And then below it shoots down like 30-pound line with like a number four circle with like a little tiny piece of whatever and like a pound weight. And I was like, all right, like covering my bases here. Like, you know, hopefully I'm, I'm still looking for, you know, new species like a sable or a hake or some bullshit like that. But, but if I like, you know, if I run into a sword, why not? But also at the same time, I'm not prepared for a sword. I, I don't have my flying gaff rig yet. And that's like, uh, that comes in clutch. You're I just going to have to lip it. <laughs> yeah, no, like what the fuck am I going to, like, I, I figure like, if I had to, like with a sword and pit, I'm more, I'm way more concerned with a sword than I would be with a striped marlin. Like that's what I've heard, anyways. Where like it's actually like stupid sharp and things like that. So, so uh, yeah, the uh, the bills on the marlin, they're like really rough sandpaper. Yeah. They do have a point. Yeah. And when we fish marlin in Japan, like I had one bill go through all the way through a cooler into the inside of it, <laughs> yeah. and then the other one stuck into the side of the boat where there's yeah. a cushion. 
but they're not it's not like knife sharp on the yeah. sides and yeah. those swordfish the sides of their bills are actually sharp yeah so if you grab it with an ungloved hand and you try to pull that pull it in by the bill like yeah. you would a uh, a marlin yeah it might slice you it feels yeah. like it will yeah um i haven't tested it yeah but i mean it definitely feels like it's sharp enough to slice into your fingers if you try to grab it by the bill are so, you using just like like a standard work glove for that when you are handling it? Or are I've you got using... neoprene. Well, they're they're like nylon neoprene Afco uh, gloves. Sure. And I use them for diving and also for fishing. Okay. Because they can stay wet twenty four seven, and they, yeah. they've held up for over a year, just constantly being wet. Yeah. Um, I like those a lot. So I use those, and they have a little bit of like a a fake leather deal on the the fingers and the palm. Yeah. So it's super easy to grab uh, lobsters and also grab fish. Yeah. So I like those. Yeah. The uh, But they don't keep your hands warm. Yeah. Because, well, one, they're still wet from the day before. So when it's early morning and I put my gloves on and I've got the tiller, my hands are still cold. So uh, I was thinking about getting some different gloves. Yeah. There's some leather ones to put on. Um, but, yeah, the sable fish, I got... I picked up a Daiwa Sea Power 1200, which is like just the slight upgrade to the Tanacon.